The lost continent of Atlantis, the most enigmatic mystery of all times. For centuries, the story of this mythical civilization has captivated the imagination of people around the world with tales of advanced technology, great wealth and untold treasures waiting to be discovered. But was Atlantis just a legend? Did it really exist? And if so, what really happened to it? We'll try to find out together in the new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome. It is not by chance that we have been so intrigued by the legends of Atlantis because in a certain sense our current race and civilization begins from the time of Atlantis. But where does this myth of this mysterious sunken island come from? One of the most famous and early mentions of Atlantis comes from the Greek philosopher Plato around 360 BC in two of his dialogues. Critias and Timaeus. Plato gave a detailed description of a country on a fertile land that he called Atlantis. He describes it as a vast island which before sinking around 10,000 years BC was located in the Atlantic Ocean beyond the Pillars of Hercules which are generally thought to refer to the Strait of Gibraltar. His knowledge of Atlantis most likely came from Solon, an Athenian lawmaker and philosopher who around 600 BC, on a trip to Egypt, learned of a great civilization that has existed 9000 years earlier. The subject of Atlantis fascinated Plato and it is believed that in order to learn more he consulted with students of Pythagoras and others who were familiar with the ancient mythological, historical and geological knowledge. Undoubtedly, Plato received some of his knowledge from initiates who were members of secret brotherhoods guarding the ancient histories. In the past, as you know, these mystery schools kept wisdom from the uninitiated as it helped ensure the safety of knowledge during danger. For most of his life, Plato refrained from writing about Atlantis. Only as he neared the end of his life did he pass on his information about the sunken continent in an attempt to ensure that the lost civilization's history is preserved. For his account of Atlantis, Plato also had access to ancient records such as those in the remarkable library of Alexandria which Edgar Cayce says was established by the Atlanteans in 10,300 BC. Plato's Atlantis was certainly a large island, perhaps the size of Western Europe, but by no means the size of an actual continent. According to him, it possessed an abundance of natural resources and was particularly rich in metals, including the famous and mysterious Orichalcum. The capital of Atlantis was located on the south coast of the island and was connected to the sea by a huge canal. The city had a circular shape of three concentric rings separated by moats. The inner citadel was about 5 kilometers in diameter, but the entire wall area measured 23 kilometers. This made the city about twice the size of Imperial Rome. In the central island stood the Palace of the Kings and the main temple of Atlantis. In Plato's words, the Atlanteans possessed such an amount of wealth as had never before been possessed by kings and rulers and is unlikely ever to be again. The few things which the city and island itself did not provide were brought to them from foreign countries because of the greatness of their empire. Plato's most famous dialogue about Atlantis, the Critias, unfortunately survives incomplete, but from another of his dialogues, the Laws, we learn that Atlantis was destroyed in a single day and night due to a catastrophic event and this fall was followed by a long dark age in which all the arts and sciences were lost. But can we trust Plato for his account of Atlantis? And do we know how the surface of the earth and in particular the part around the northwest coast of Africa looked like more than 12,000 years ago at the time of the supposed existence of Atlantis? 
Although Plato's account certainly provides interesting information about the existence of Atlantis, it still does not give us enough data as to where exactly Atlantis was located. To learn more, we must turn to geology and oceanography to the study of the evolution of the world's oceans. It is theorized that Atlantis was a volcanic continent located in the mid-Atlantic rich region and primarily connected to Europe, Africa and North America by temperature temporary land bridges. Atlantis has its great territorial expansion from 23 to 5.3 million years ago, when it formed an almost continuous land mass stretching from the northern Appalachian continent to the southern tip of Africa. Then, till its disappearance, Atlantis existed as two separate islands, a northern island, Ruda or Poseidonis, and a southern island, Daitia. The northern island of Poseidonis still existed as a substantial landmass until the last ice age when it sank as a result of tectonic movements and a general rise in global sea levels. It is believed that the Azores and Madeira are some of the last parts of the Atlantic continent still above water. If we remove the waters of the ocean to see the bottom, the mid-Atlantic ridge would appear as a continuous mountain range, comparable in length to the Andes and Rockies of America combined, and in heights comparable to the Himalayas. Today's Azores, Madeiras, Cape Verde, and the Canary Islands represent only the highest peaks of this submerged chain. But was Atlantis really located there? During the Middle Ages, most ancient texts, including Plato's Legend of Atlantis, sank into oblivion. It wasn't until the Renaissance, when people began to look back and rediscover ancient knowledge, that interest in this sunken island resurfaced. Over the past 500 years, many different theories have emerged about a continent lost in the Atlantic Ocean. But do they match the story told by Plato, or do they hide within themselves another knowledge. And do we know who the Atlanteans really were? How was their civilization created? Were aliens involved in the origin of Atlantis, as many speculate? An interesting and a little bit more esoteric hypothesis about the origin of Atlantis comes from Ismael Perez, author of a new and very intriguing book, Our Cosmic Origin. In it, he tells that Atlantis was created by humanoid beings from the Pleiades, in the fifth dimension. They managed to integrate and maintain the balance between the spiritual and material worlds and as a result, had a high technological development in harmony with the spiritual. The preceding great civilization, that of Lemuria or Mu, was highly concentrated only on the spiritual. They gradually began to lose touch with physical reality and the lower dimensions. This would raise the level of consciousness on the planet which was their mission but without the lower dimensions. Being well integrated, Atlantis was the solution to connect the low to the high dimensions and integrate the two polarities. According to esoteric teachings and theosophy, humanity develops through seven great evolutionary cycles called root races, which must gradually develop the collective consciousness of the planet. Each root race has physical and mental qualities completely different from those of the previous one, as well as a specific mission to follow. Atlantis was the fourth root race and the first truly human and terrestrial race. Elena Blavatska, a Russian mystic and occultist, says that the fourth root race arose about 8 million years BC and she called it the race of the red man. But the beginning of the Atlantean civilization is shrouded in mystery. According to the esoteric tradition, the higher spiritual entities assumed human form and incarnated on earth at the beginning of the Atlantean period. Therefore, they were divine men, dual beings, supreme spirits who took human bodies, wrote the great philosopher and esoterist Rudolf Steiner, who also added that their true home is not on earth. The first period of Atlantean civilization gave way to a second and then a third Neo-Atlantean period, during which Atlantean civilization spread from its island homeland to other parts of the world. 
Each world age or period has been separated from the previous one by natural cataclysms, great earth cataclysms of which the final submersion of Atlantis in 9600 BC was the latest. Do we know what the Atlanteans look like? Theosophical teaching describes the fourth race as giants. Although their bodies were reduced in height compared to those of the Lemurians, they were relatively taller than us and this gave rise to numerous legends of Cyclops and Titans mentioned in many ancient traditions. According to Blavatska, the Atlanteans were the race that teach the pinnacle of physical development. She says, then came the Atlanteans, the giants whose physical beauty and strength reached their culmination in accordance with evolutionary law. In principle, the Atlanteans possessed a third eye developed during the Lemurian race which had spiritual functions. In time, however, with the improvement of the human structure, the materiality and the corruption of mankind, the third eye gradually disappeared. Edgar Cayce, the famous psychic and healer, also talks about life in Atlantis. Most of its information relates to the last 20,000 years of the civilization's existence, but it also gives details of the early stages of development. Cayce says that people appeared on Earth in five places at the same time. The yellow race in the Gobi, the white in the Carpathians, the red in the Atlantic and American lands, the brown in the Andes, and the black in Africa. This happened more than 10 million 500 years ago. Based on them, we get the information that the five races were the sons of God mentioned in the Bible. The daughters of men with whom they made the mistake of mating were actually the original strange forms left over from the early attempts at material projection. The result was a race of hybrids. At the beginning of the Atlantean civilization, a difference arose regarding these hybrids. One group, the children of the Law of One, wanted to keep the human race pure but help the hybrids regain their position as God's creatures. The other group, the sons of Belial, believed only in sensual gratification and treated hybrids as slaves. According to Casey, Atlantis disappeared in three separate cataclysms around 50,000 BC, 28,000 BC and 10,000 BC. The first of these because of the use of advanced technology for destructive purposes and the second destruction was preceded by fighting between the two factions. Then the children of the Law of Unity emigrated to Peru, Yucatan, Nevada, Colorado, the Pyrenees and Egypt. During the last third period of Atlantis is the time when Egypt reached a high level of civilization and the pyramids and the Sphinx were built. But let's now look another story, one involving the Galactic Federation and alien beings fighting for control on Earth. This account about the creation of the Atlantean civilization is given by Matthias de Stefano, an indigo child who remembers his distant past life in the Atlantean colony of Chem, current Egypt. Matthias recounts that Atlantis was built in 16,000 BC by the Aesir, a race of extraterrestrial giants also known as Anunnaki between the Azores, Canaries and Cape Green Islands. The Aesir came to Earth seeking a place to live and for digging precious metals. They settled in the Middle East where they conducted DNA experiments with Earth people to create the optimal life form for the planet. The offspring of the Aesir and humans were Atlanteans, chosen for the truth and the only way for the Aesir to survive on Earth and preserve their knowledge. Over time, the Aesir split into two groups, one using humans as slaves and the other guiding and teaching them. The benevolent part of the Aesir and the Arcturians took some of their descendants away to protect them and to let them develop independently without the direct interference of extraterrestrial advanced civilizations. From them, 12 children were chosen to store information from each constellation, thus creating the 12 great families of Atlantis. The first islands settled were Kaifu, Cape Green, Ekaron, Canary Islands, and Eunuch Azores. The main city and center of the empire was called Hephis, and like Plato's description, it was circular in shape. 
At the peak of the Atlantean Empire, the islands were home to around 300,000 people, and due to their presence of Arcturian DNA, the Atlanteans had blue blood and kept their bloodline pure to preserve their knowledge from the star people and guide the rest of humanity. If the Lemurians, the civilization before Atlantis, sought to reach a higher level of consciousness by looking inward, the Atlanteans were oriented outward toward the material world. They knew how to use sound and vibration to influence the world around them, and they built devices to transmit information and energy all over the planet. Through them, they could heal, regenerate their bodies, connect with other dimensions. Thus, advanced technology and cosmic knowledge of energy use gave the Atlanteans incredible advantages and capabilities. But as we know, every single thing is good only when it is in balance. And what happens when the balance is disturbed? Interestingly, in most of the various sources of information related to the direction of the Atlanteans' development, the stories follow almost the same plot. As receivers of the knowledge of Lemuria, the Atlanteans began their development from the spiritual. For thousands of years, they have followed the principles inherited from Mu, but at the same time, they have also achieved unsurpassed technological success, thus maintaining the balance between the inner and the outer. At some point, however, a division occurred and one part of the Atlanteans began to pursue dominance over the entire planet. They started abusing the technology they have created causing a cataclysm. Some say a pulse shift, others say they directed energy weapons at themselves, causing the continent to sink. In esoteric beliefs, this is the moment of the fall, after which humanity loses most of its energy abilities and enters the period of darkness. In our consciousness, Atlantis is remembered as the cradle of all that we can call occult and esoteric knowledge precisely because they mastered the use of the so-called life force. For a long period of time, Atlantis flourished. Originally and from its inception, Atlantis was in accordance with the principles of Lemuria which governed things according to the celestial order of light. All the sister colonies honor Lemuria as their motherland, for Lemuria was a representation of the feminine principle, based on freedom, harmony, and spiritual community. The early Atlanteans lived in a perfect society just like the Lemurians and worshipped the divine feminine in balance with the divine masculine. Edgar Cayce described the Atlanteans of the early years of Atlantis as thinking people, people of intuitive influence, who had access to the future and the past. How did they achieve this? By developing the right side of the brain of their children and by respecting their insights and dreams. As infants, we are more open to our psychic senses, not only because we are still very close to the other side of life, but our speech is not fully developed so we have to rely on our feelings, senses to connect with the physical world. The Atlanteans easily taught their children how to use their psychic abilities and generally just rely on their intuition. As adults, some of them developed tremendous discipline of mind and devoted their lives to applying the knowledge they acquired. The lifestyle of the people of Atlantis also contributed to the preservation of their psychic abilities as they were always in close contact with the natural environment. According to the Austrian occultist Rudolf Steiner, the Atlanteans were the first to discover how to convert the life force into a force that can be applied for technological purposes by which many of the apparent miracles attributed to the Atlantean science were performed. Steiner describes this power as a power inherent in all living things, which manifests itself through the processes of germination and growth. The life force was known in ancient times as prana or mana. Occultists in the 19th and 20th century knew it as Vril, meaning the universal principle of life energy, life force or life magnetism. 
Control of the life force or Vril gave the Atlanteans almost superhuman powers over the entire world of manifestation and other spiritual realities. With the Vril, the Atlanteans were able to control time, manipulate matter, reverse gravity, while also providing unlimited energy to power all manner of mechanical devices. They developed a technology that, while different from ours, is superior in many ways. The wild flower fields and lush green forests of these beautiful lands were not disfigured by strips of metal and concrete to facilitate fast travel by bullet trains and automobiles. Instead, people managed to live happily without polluting the environment and depleting their natural resources. Edgar Cayce's readings, meanwhile, described the Atlanteans gaining power from the great crystal from sound and from the splitting of the atom. He says that with the energy flowing from the crystal, the people of Atlantis enjoyed traveling through air, water and under the sea, voice transmission over long distances and the benefits of lasers. Will the time come when we will fly freely in space just as the Atlanteans? And how exactly did they extract and direct this life energy? Using their highly developed skills, the Atlanteans were able to obtain energy from a wide variety of other sources, including the sun, the mind, the earth's magnetic field, and sound. Edgar Cayce mentions the first important crystal in Atlantis as the Tuahoi stone. The Atlanteans originally amplified the light that its six sides received from the sun to enhance meditation and contemplation and to communicate with the spirit realm. After thousands of years, as humans became more materially oriented, the priests perfected the great crystal which, when properly controlled, magnified and directed the energy it gathered. With the source of infinite power, the Atlanteans gained the ability to travel through the air on and under water. To construct the huge multi-faced stone, the Atlantean scientists placed a large piece of precision cut quartz crystal on top of a building that served as a solar type transducer. In this open space, the facets of the crystal focused the energy from the sun's rays, just as parabolic mirrors do today. A movable dome over the top of the intricate quartz stone allowed skilled engineers to control the amount of light exposure from above. The Atlanteans lined the building with the crystal with a non-conductive material similar to asbestos. Casey describes a central power plant on Earth that provided the energy from the Great Crystal, allowing the Atlanteans to overcome gravity. According to Casey, powerful beams from the Great Crystal sent the energy to receptor crystals which were charged. From there, the energy could be used to drive an electric or thermal engine in a vehicle or other mechanical device. This was one of the several examples of the Atlantean's ability to transmit energy wirelessly. Casey also mentions that the Big Crystal could have received energy from the stars, from various sources in space. We know the Bermuda Triangle stories. Many ships and low-flying planes have disappeared forever without any explanation in the Bermuda Triangle. If the radios are working, pilots sometimes report that their engines lose power, that their compasses rotate counterclockwise and that other navigational equipment behaves erratically or stops functioning. Suddenly, passengers find that they, along with their ships or planes, are in thick Fog. Could a powerful crystal from the time of Atlantis be causing these disturbances? What if there is a crystal hidden below the water that captures the sun's rays and transmit energy the moment another vehicle passes over it? So far, we have explored the different stories and theories about the creation of Atlantis, its people and some of the technologies they used. But what caused its destruction? Did this great civilization disappear as a result of a random, natural cataclysm? Or did they themselves cause their own extinction? We bow before you and thank you for watching another episode of Secret Origins. Keep your minds open and until we meet again.